May God's blessing be on the reading and hearing of our scriptures this morning. Shall we pray? O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find acceptance in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, apologies to those who expected to hear about the return of the unclean spirit. I'm not sure what happened. In my original notes, I had intended to do this parable of the bridesmaids, and somewhere along the line, maybe the unclean spirits themselves tried to intercede. But uh, we'll save that story for another time. I wanted to talk about this parable of the bridesmaids because it's interesting to me that I think the power for us today is not likely what it was originally intended to be. The power for us today is rooted somewhere else. And for us to understand that, it will help to be grounded first in the Old Testament, in the Jewish religious history and traditions from which we come. And before we do that, we need to go back even further to the widespread feelings in the ancient world about what kind of God God was or is. Old traditions that likely had their origin in the ancient understandings of the universe. And we talked about this a little bit before, about the world being flat at the center of the, of the universe. You know, it didn't move. Uh, God, gods were up and they were good. So we people down here, humanity, we were bad. We're talking about this a little bit in confirmation class a couple of weeks ago. And uh, they said to me, oh, yeah, yeah, flat earth doesn't move. That's uh, geocentric. I said, what? They said, geocentric. You know, the earth is at the center of things. I, I said, I know what it means. But where, did, where did you learn that? Oh, they said, we've been talking about that in school. That's not what, what it really is, though. We live in a heliocentric universe where the sun is at the center thought, huh, people who were paying UE school taxes, your, your money is being well spent and well invested. Yeah. But that's where we get this idea of, of dualism, opposite sides, opposed to one another, in this case, up and down. Gods and God's people are the people always in tension. We, we see it in a Greek and Roman mythology, do we not? how the gods and people were always having these troubled relationships and difficulty one with another. This tension with God continues into the Old Testament and even into the New Testament, but particularly in the Old. God is portrayed as an angry, vengeful God, a God who requires sacrifice to be appeased. First, we would sacrifice people. Now, we don't do that. But how about sacrificing animals? Now nah, that didn't seem to be working. God's own son was sacrificed. Somehow, God was going to exact satisfaction. Someday, in some way. And so, you better be careful and watch out. You will rue the day when God comes. Because the time of reckoning will be upon you like paying the bill. How many of us have heard, how many of us have used the phrase... Just wait till your father gets home. Just you wait. We continue to hear that today, don't we? Fire and brimstone. Oh, tell people how bad they are, how evil we are. There's a whole strain of theological thought about what terrible people we are, what terrible beings. The lowest of the low, we are dirty. We are so bad, no one would want us. So bad that even our mothers wouldn't love us except for the love of God in Jesus Christ first. Well, with that kind of thought, is it any wonder so many people are reluctant to go to church? Who would want to deal with a God like that? If you're looking for help and hope, you're not going to find it there. But we can't avoid it. It is true that there is in the Old Testament this this thread, this view, understanding of God as angry and vengeful, just looking for us to make a mistake so we can be punished. But it's equally true. There is a different strand of understanding. In my Bible, this passage from Micah that was read earlier in the service is headed, God's compassion and steadfast love. 
This God pardons sin. This God passes over mistakes that we make. This God does not retain anger, it says, but forever delights in showing forgiveness. This God will have compassion on us and will tread our iniquities underfoot, you know, get rid of it, make them insignificant. This God will cast our sins into the sea and show faithfulness to us. As God showed faithfulness to our ancestors, Jacob and Abraham, from the days of old. Now, this is a very different understanding of God than we often get. But it's present more often than we think. The problem is that we've been conditioned to see and to live under this notion of the angry, spiteful God so much that we forget or we pass over the God of compassion and steadfast love. But I would submit that it's this latter understanding of God that Jesus taps into, for which Jesus lived, and for which Jesus died. God and being in God's presence are not to be feared, but to be welcomed. And this brings us to our New Testament reading. The entire story of Jesus, the whole New Testament, was written by people who had not only this gracious understanding of God in their, in their heads, but also the ancient, deeply rooted understanding of God as angry and vengeful. And that included Matthew and his followers who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. So understanding where it comes from, the meaning of the parable of the bridesmaids can be pretty clear. We we, we remember the story, ten bridesmaids, uh, five took their lamps but didn't take any oil. The other five took lamps, made sure they had plenty of oil. The groom was delayed, so it was dark when he got there. It was midnight. This was before municipal electric, so there were no street lights. It was dark. The five with the oil in their lamps could see to escort the groom into the banquet hall. The five without oil could not. And as if that was bad enough, the five who had the oil wouldn't share it with the ones who did not. So the five who had no oil had to go off and buy some, and when they were gone, the banquet door was shut. They were too late. And even when they came back and pleaded to get in, they were told, no, it's too late. You don't know when the angry, vengeful God will come. So you better live right, and you better live righteously. You better repent and turn now while you can. Because if God comes and you're not ready, it's going to be too late. Tough cookies. That's probably the original understanding of this parable. And it fits, does it not, the ancient God versus humanity view of us and the holy. But it does not, however, fit the understanding of the God who Jews and Christians and even Muslims see as a God of compassion and steadfast love. How then can this parable of the bridesmaids be of help to us rather than one that just tries to cheer the bejesus out of us, so maybe we'll do the right thing because we're frightened. Well, that brings me to a story. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I I don't have that many good stories. Um, My my career in ministry has been pretty pretty mundane and and pedestrian. Um, But there have been instances where some things have happened that just crystallized some truths for me, and this is one of them. I call it the Betty story. The Betty story. It happened in a previous church. I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was in trouble when I got to church for worship that Sunday morning because the secretary and the custodian were in the vestibule pacing back and forth, back and forth, very worried expressions on their faces. So I walked in, and the custodian began. I don't know what we're going to do, Mark. I told her she shouldn't do it. I told her she couldn't go in there, but she's in the sanctuary, and it's just, I don't know what we're going to do. She's in there all alone, and it's, it's, it's not good. And on and on he went. Until I finally turned to the secretary with that expression, you know, what is going on? She said a young woman came in, obviously distressed, and she's in the sanctuary sitting alone. She's crying, very, very distressed. So I put my things down and went into the sanctuary, and it was easy to find her. She was sitting alone in the back, 
hair disheveled, dirty clothes, eyes and face streaked with tears, just trembling with sobs. I determined her name was Betty, and she said, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's all, I'm losing everything. I can't, I can't go on like this. I just can't. She allowed me to take her into my office. She didn't need to stay in the sanctuary and be a spectacle to everybody who came in. We went in the office, and she said, I've tried to stop. I've tried to quit. I've quit before, but I can't stop the drinking. And now my boyfriend says he's going to leave me, and I, I can't. I can't lose him. I'll lose everything, but I can't stop. I don't know what to do. She continued to take Kleenex from my, the box on my desk. Well, one of the things I learned early on is there, are a lot, there is a lot I don't know. And one of the things I don't know is how to help an alcoholic in distress. But I asked her, I said, would you talk to someone from AA? Yes, she said she would. So I picked up the phone and called and got the operator, told her what it was, and she said, just a minute. And she put me through. A woman answered, picked up the phone. I would guess she was in her mid to late 50s gravelly voice, and honest, I could smell the cigarette smoke coming through the telephone. She said, what's, what's going on? So I explained I had Betty here and so on and so forth. She needs to talk to someone. Well, put her on. So I did, and busied myself at my desk while Betty talked to the woman from AA, and I could hear Betty's side of the conversation. Yes. Yes, I know I need to stop. Yes, I want to stop. I will. This time I mean it. Yes, I will all the time, crying and sobbing. And Yes, yes, I know where that church is. Yes, I know. Yes, yes, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. You know, I can be there. I will. I will be there. Hung up the phone. She stood up, grabbed another Kleenex, and I knew what she was going to say. I knew it before she even started to say it. I want to stay for church. Well, I didn't have a problem with her staying for church, but in her state, still very agitated and upset, she couldn't sit alone. And who would I have her sit with? Not everybody is ready to sit and be of help to someone in this situation. But with a confidence either born of foolishness or great faith, I'm not sure which, I took her by the elbow and walked out of the office, across the vestibule and into the rear of the sanctuary. And it was still maybe 20 minutes before the service. I scanned, and there she was. There she was, sitting way down front. The story gets a little bit complicated here because this church member's name was Betty also, hence the name of the story. Betty was one of the matriarchs of the church. She and her husband had been a part of that congregation for years and years and years. He sang in the choir. Their kids sang in the choir. Their grandchildren were singing in the choir. One of the grandchildren directed the junior choir, and so on. Every morning, every Sunday morning, Betty was there, down front, while everybody else gathered. She was in prayer and meditation. With renewed confidence, I took Betty from the the community, and down we went. And I interrupted Betty in the pew and explained, Betty, this is Betty. Betty. I, I said, Betty here from the community is having a hard time today. She wants to stay for church. Could she sit with you? Betty from the church did not hesitate an eyelash. She took her purse from this side, put it on the other side, patted the seat next to her, said, come, sit with me. And I went off and did what I needed to do to get ready and came back in and the service went on. And I noticed Betty's grandchildren were coming in and normally they would sit with her, but today they stayed away, a distance. They were nervous about Betty from the community who was still upset. They knew Grandma had it well in hand, but they didn't want to get too close. We went through the service and I could tell that Betty from the community was not a church person. She didn't, wasn't exactly sure what we were doing as we went along, but Betty from the church helped her. The service ended, and as quickly as I could finish greeting people, I went to look for Betty from the community, but she was gone. 
And Betty from the church came to me and said, well, uh, she's gone, said, I, Mark, I don't know if I was any help to her. Uh, I, I didn't know what to say to her. And I'm standing there thinking, well, I know what to say. I've been to school for this. I've been in ministry then. It was, I don't know, 10, 15 years. I had all the education. We talk about God's existential, ever-present and imminent, prevenient, inexhaustible grace that will come over us, prefiguring that apocalyptic time when God and Jesus Christ will absolve us from all our sins and institute a new and a right spirit within us so we can be justified and be in communion and community with God and all those whom God has saved and the angels for eternity. Isn't that what we believe? I'm not even sure I know what I just said, but, but I think that's what we believe. But Betty from the congregation said, Mark, I didn't know what to say to her. I, I just gave her a hug. And I said to her, God loves you. And I love you too. And she left. And I remember standing there thinking, oh my, am I glad it was Betty from the church who was the last person Betty from the community spoke to rather than speaking to me. Since that incident, for me, the parable of the ten bridesmaids is not about God trying to trick me or trick me or punish me. The parable is to me God inviting me to be ready, to be prepared, to be alert, because the time for service, the time to use gifts and graces will come at unexpected times, in unexpected places, and in unexpected ways. Betty from the church had no reason to believe that that Sunday was going to be different from any of the other hundreds and hundreds she had worshipped in that church. But in that moment, when I brought somebody to her, her lamp was filled with oil, her wick was trimmed, and she was ready. A needy soul was touched, love was given, and love was received. The parable implores us to be ready to use whatever we have in service to God and Jesus Christ. Whatever we've got, whether it's a little or whether it's much. Because with God's grace, whatever we have is what will be needed at that time. And it's all that will be needed. We use our gifts and graces, whatever we've got. I'm not a fan of Emeril Lagasse, the, the chef, but I caught his show one time and he was talking about making gumbo. And he said, the secret is you use whatever you got. He was saying this to the audience in the studio. I like to put carrots in my gumbo. But if you don't have carrots, you use whatever you got. I like to put turnips in my gumbo. But if you don't have turnips, what do you use? And the audience said, whatever you got. I like to put okra in, he said. But if you don't have okra, what do you use? And they just shouted back, whatever you got. Isn't that a reason for Thanksgiving? We and God, in and through Jesus Christ, in partnership, one with another, seeking not to condemn the world, but to save the world by bringing healing and wholeness. And we all have them, every single one of us, gifts and graces. Some of us, money, skills, abilities. We all have them in varying degrees. We understand that. Some of us are more generously endowed with some than others. Yes, there are things I wish I could do that I can't. There are ways I wish I could be that I cannot be. This body and this mind are what I have. Oh, there's some flexibility and some uh, possibilities I could nurture, but my uniqueness remains, the pluses and the minuses. But I give thanks for what I have, for what I can do, and I seek to do all that I can with what I have. So yes, it is true, I'm thankful for food, for family, for the life I'm privileged to live. Not everybody has that. But I also know there are some who have far more. But the parable of the ten bridesmaids simply says, be alert to use whatever I have. And in that doing, 
then there is life, and life abundantly. Several weeks later, I don't know, a month or two later, the secretary called me in. She said, uh, there's somebody here who needs to talk to you. And there was a young woman there, blonde hair, clean, faded jeans, but you know, in a way that's stylish, a nice, attractive blouse, had a jaunty look in her eye. She said, uh, you know who I am? I hate it when people ask me that. No, I don't know. I don't know who you are. She said, I'm Betty. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was here, and, you know, somebody named Betty in the church helped me out, and I, I wondered if she was here. I wanted to thank her. Uh, I've been going to my meeting. I haven't had a drink. My boyfriend has got a job in Florida, and we're leaving at the end of the week, and uh, things are going really, really well. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God to Betty from the church. Thanks be to God for all the Bettys. And thanks be to God for each of us in the loving witness that we live in the name of Jesus Christ. All the more reason to give praise to our Lord, the Almighty, the ruler of our creation. When we sing, may it be that our souls do indeed praise God, our help and our salvation, drawing near to the temple of God's heart, joining in glad adoration. Shall we pray? We are so grateful, O oh God, for the gifts that you give us. Most of all, the gift of your grace and the gift of faith that we can employ what we have for your service in the name of Jesus Christ to the uplifting of all in the world whom you call your own. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.